I've told a story about um, how he wrote his first Baron book. And that was about 1938-39. That was when the war was coming. Now the war was, in a way, a huge opportunity for Dad, for the right and wrong reasons. He had polio, so he couldn't go to war and fight. So he determined that he'd write books for the boys in the front and their mums and dads back home. And he went into the same room at the same time as Leslie Charteris, to the same publisher, but not the same editor. They didn't have editors, they were all fighting in the front. And they came out and wrote lots of books. Dad chose the tough stories because he'd already written a number of short stories and the kind of penny dreadfuls that they used to have in magazines in the early days. So let's go on. He's now written about a hundred and about thirty-six books every year for four years. So he's now got a huge amount of books and he's becoming pretty well known. And his, my mum, his wife, was pretty proud. And there was this guy, wherever you went, there were John Creasy books. And he knew that he wanted to get his books sold overseas. So for one of the very first times, although he got the Baron books published in America, because the Baron was published in America after that first thing, they weren't published in the 1950s. So he got them to Queen Mary, and he went across the Atlantic with a whole bunch of the books he wrote in the war. And he gave them to five or six agents, and he gave them to five or six publishers. And all of them very quickly came back, because he said he was only there for a couple of weeks, very quickly came back to tell him, thank you for coming. They'd had a chance to read a few of the books. And with the best will in the world, it really loved the energy, really loved the subject lines. But he was writing from a different kind of perspective from the ones the Americans would like. He was a parochial writer. He would never really break through and write in the international market. But what you're doing is great, so don't please go back home sad. Go back home really spirited and write more for your own country. Six days later, he gets back home, gets to Bournemouth, where I was born, and my mum is waiting for him. We had a five-bedroom house because he was quite successful with a flagpole in front, which I can still see. And it was Mum's treasure. She came from a little village called Catistock where her father was the local baker. And in fact, if you go on British Airways planes now, you can buy Fudge Bakery. My maiden name is Fudge. So you can still get the biscuits. Anyway, he comes back from there and he says, we're selling the house. And my mum says, we're not selling the house. We're selling the house. We're going away. What do you mean we're going away? We're going around the world for a year. Now, Dad had polio, I was five, my brother was six. There was no way that this is what Mum wanted. And the house was precious, precious to her. Anyway, so the only idea she could come up with, because he was a pretty persuasive man, the only idea she could come up with is, I'm not going around the world by train. And actually that was a big deal, because in those days, every night you'd go to a, sometimes the same hotel, you need a different dress. So you'd have 40 bags would be what most women of substance would travel around the world with on their liners and things. I'm not going around the world and I'm not taking 40 bags. So to which Dad said, we'll drive. I mean by train. We'll drive, says Dad. He'd never driven before. He had this leg which didn't work very well on the left, on the left foot. The clutch didn't work very well. But I'm going to telescope it a little bit. Three or four months later, he'd got his driving license, which sold the house we were on the Astalone Castle. We were going from Southampton down to Cape Town with a Humber Super Snipe in the hold. And we got to Cape Town, and I can remember it well, it was written about it. I charged into my parents' cabin and said, Mummy and Daddy, get up, get up, Africa's coming. Not quite true, but it was what I felt at the time. By the time we'd got there, he'd more or less written a book. So by the time we got to Cape Town and then Johannesburg and Durban, he went to those publishers. And he got them to sell the book. After all, it was a book about coming down to Africa. And he got them to buy more. And by the time 460-odd days later, we'd got to New York, he went into the same publishers, he went to the same agents, he said, you're right, I was a terrible writer. I've reread the books. I'm embarrassed I brought them to you. But I promise I've changed. And I was parochial. But since then, I've had books published in South Africa in Pakistan, in India, in Australia, in New Zealand, and in Canada. And I really want you to publish mine in America. And to cut a long story short, from more or less that time on, the next 400 of his books were published simultaneously in English, in America, and in England. And that was the third story of a trilogy of stories about this astonishing character.